Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you for taking the time. It's an honor to sit here with you. Um, you've done a remarkable job with, um, with your work with the Sustainability Lab, and, and the more I read and understand what you're doing, I think it's really phenomenal, and I think everybody should know about it. And so, you know, I want to I ask you about it and talk to you about it, but first, um, I'm interested because you've had a, an interesting career and, and really figured out ways to best express your knowledge in a way that was, as you say, integrated with who you are. I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about your own journey, your life's journey to where you are now. Yeah, so, so please. Well, yeah. first, it's a great <laughs> to be here. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Speaking with you, I, I, uh, my journey, I, I, uh, I'm not quite sure how to, where to start there. I, I, as you know, I was, I was born in Israel and grew up there, uh, which in retrospect, I think, given the time, uh, when I was, uh, when I grew up, uh, had probably a, a, a tremendous uh, influence. Uh, this was a time of the nation being bored, so to speak, everybody being a pioneer and uh, all the ethos of, uh, of uh, creation, if you will, was mm -hmm. very powerful. And I think that that had a big impact, uh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because yeah, you're truly a pioneering, you have a pioneering spirit. Well, I, uh, you know, that, that's what I'm trying to say, that the, the yeah. ethos of pioneering, that's what you grew up with. I mean, if you're not a pioneer, you, you're nobody, so to speak. So it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I was never conscious of it at the time, but the, kind of in retrospect, it looks like an almost an obvious, uh, that's how you were brainwashed <laughs> mm -hmm. to, to do pioneering things. Uh, to some extent, it's still true for that country, although it's changed a lot in the last uh, half century or, 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 uh, or, or so. Yeah. At the time, it was very powerful, and so uh, you were conditioned by this ideology uh, that basically uh, focused on something new happening, mm -hmm. on the idea that you, you, you do things against all odds and all other things that I, I think now I can see reflected in some of the things I'm trying to do. Right. And, and so you, you started out... Um, going to, your original training was as an architect, but somewhere along the way you met Buckminster Fuller, who, who is a legend to so many people, an iconic figure, and he was a major, you, you got to work with him, true, right? And, yes, and I, I, left, uh, I, I left Israel uh, when I was 21, after the, the finishing the, ser the military service, pr pretty much the next morning. Uh -huh. I knew for a long time before, since my teens, that I wanted to study architecture. I, found that I had uh, that, that physical structures had a intense impact mm -hmm. uh, on me so I wanted to study architecture and I, I left for England to the AA and uh, I was just starting the first year of the first the, the first semester of the first year when I had the chance to meet Fuller mm -hmm. and that of course was very impactful right I mean could you say a little bit I mean you're one of the lucky people alive now who who had such direct contact with him. Could you say a little bit about well, he, him? Well, he was in London at the time, uh, and he gave a lecture to the, well, I think it's called the, the British, uh, the, the Association of British Students of Architecture, something like that. And uh, I didn't know much about him or anything, but I just ended up going to that lecture. And what Fuller was talking about at the time, what he was uh, promoting, was a project that he was trying to get off the ground that he called the World Design Science mm -hmm. Decade. That was a typical Fuller, like a real outrageous idea, mm -hmm. uh, but completely right in mm -hmm. many ways. And the idea was that all the architectural students in all the architectural schools in the world will collaborate on a 10-year program to do what? To redesign the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never heard anything like this. I mean, to me, architecture was Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright or, or mm -hmm. Corbusier. And you know, you design a building, you design a chair, but here was somebody talking about designing the planet. Mm -hmm. And that was completely a, a total, uh, like yeah. somebody hit you with a two by four on the head. And uh, so my immediate emotional reaction was, uh, how, where do you sign up for this? Uh -huh. And as it turned out, next to me was sitting a young, uh, at the time, a young tutor uh, from the, it was not my own direct tutor, but I knew him from the, and so mm -hmm. I turned Keith Critchlow who was a painter who was teaching at the, at the time. I turned to him in my excitement, and as it turned out, he was saying that he was doing some 
research on geometry, uh, working with Fuller on Fuller synergetic geometry, which mm -hmm. is the, 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 the system that Fuller developed, and that he was going to have breakfast with him the next morning and whether if I want to join. Wow. So, uh, of course, I, <laughs> I, wow. I did join, and uh, uh -huh. it was uh, an amazing experience. You're going there like you go to Mecca, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, but we hit it off yeah. personally right away, and uh -huh. I decided to uh, work on that program. And it turned out very quickly that, that uh, it, there was a lot to do there. Yeah, and the luckily the school, the AA at the time, was very avant-garde, very progressive school, as uh -huh. I'm sure it still is. Uh, and they allowed me off of schoolwork to do projects with Fuller, in lieu of the work that I was doing with him. Uh -huh. So basically, I didn't have to be there in classes. I could go other places, and, and at the end of the year, I had to always uh, do all the exams, all the requirements that uh -huh. my peers had to go to pass from year to year. So the second year we spent in, in uh, Africa, uh, the third year somewhere else, and so throughout my five years, together with Keith, we, we were really doing a lot of work in relation to that uh, World Design wow. Science program. Wow. And when I graduated, he invited me to join his staff here, which is how I came to the United States. Yeah, and, and so it's interesting, I mean, that if you hadn't gone to that talk by Buckminster Fuller, or, and if this fellow Keith hadn't been sitting next to you, one or the other or both, your life might be totally different. You oh, think. completely. I mean, this is the fascinating thing about life. You see that you can never plan uh -huh. the really important things. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So th this, you could not have put it together. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so this this would be say for another conversation. Was was this some, you know, coincidence or was serendipity or something? Well, you, you know, you know, Jung's doesn't believe in coincidences. But right, I, right. I, it means you know. I think again, in retrospect, when you look at it, it means that there's an encounter, an event. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether you're ready for it or right. not. And, yeah, and, uh, the door was open. Yeah. Did you were you ready to go in? Yeah. So that that by itself says a lot about you and 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 an inspiration for others too. Just but it certainly was a deflecting influence. This is why I never ended up in architecture. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you hadn't been there, you'd be sitting right now in your architecture design firm and designing some building somewhere. The newest, be, yes. the newest post could, office or something. That was the intention yeah. originally. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, that's incredible that you had you know sat at the the, the feet of a god, <laughs> Mr. Fuller. Um, so so then, um, so your your story is continues that while while working with Buck, Mr. Fuller, you were working on your PhD in cy the field of cybernetics, um, and so. I, I, cybernetics is an interesting field. I've heard about it for many years. Um, mathematicians have, have helped um, contribute to it. And I saw one quote about cybernetics um, by um, the first president of the American Society for Cybernetics. And, he's, and he defines cybernetics as the science and art of the understanding of understanding. So I'm um, wondering if you could say more about cybernetics because that also, right, has influenced you in many ways. Yeah. Well, I think that this definition is being a little cute, uh -huh. and, and, uh, but it has a lot uh, to it. What it tries, I think, to point out to is that in recent years, uh, a lot of uh, the, the theoretical thrust has been about understanding the nature of knowledge mm -hmm. and the interactions of observers with the world and the nature of that interaction and what it means about uh, w w what is knowledge, mm -hmm. and hence this definition. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the original definition, of course, is slightly different. Uh, but first, perhaps, uh, it, it may be important to say why I chose that uh, mm -hmm. discipline in the first place. And uh, I, I, in, in working with Fuller, I became very uh, deeply involved with his geometry and his math. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a, a, a system that he developed that actually brought about the many of his invention, the geodesic domes and other right, other right. structures. Uh, but user uh, Fuller basically was a Neoplatonist, if you will, and yeah. he liked to use uh, models from geometry uh -huh. as cosmologies uh, uh -huh. to try to use geometry as as a conceptual ways to describe how the world works mm -hmm. uh, and. I, although I became an expert in his, uh, in his geometry, I never was completely happy with uh, geometrical models uh -huh. uh, uh, 
I, I thought there were some limitations to what you can do with uh, geometry. And in those years, general system theory and cybernetics in particular were beginning to kind of uh, uh, come to the fore. And I felt that the new epistemology was developing in those arenas to deal with issues of complexity in mm -hmm. general. How, how complex systems work, how do they right. evolve, how they develop, how they decline, how they change, how they manage themselves. Uh -huh. Uh, and that's why I gravitated to that uh, arena. And the story of cybernetics itself is, is quite an interesting one. Uh, it it, it uh, emerged during the Second World War, where towards the end of the war, the, the, the jet airplanes were introduced, and humans who manned uh, anti-aircraft guns became too sluggish because of the speed of aircraft to follow uh -huh. it and to aim and shoot and correct for deviations and so forth. So there was a project that was uh, put together at MIT, headed by Norbert Wiener, who was a right. mathematician, yeah. uh, to try and develop automatic controls for anti-aircraft guns. Hmm. Like many other things, unfortunately, like many other good things, unfortunately, the, the, the start is with the military. So in any event, uh, I, I think Winner was able to assemble around him a very interesting kind of multidisciplinary groups of uh, people early, some of the early days of computer sciences was mm -hmm. there with John Vum, uh, von Neumann and others, mm -hmm. uh, some people from neurology, physiology, and they began to think through how to develop those things. And I think that as the logic of the circuitry to control uh, those mechanisms mm -hmm. began to evolve, they realized that the underlying kind of math for that was the same as the logic that describe all the physiological mechanisms in the body, mm -hmm. uh, all the homostatic mechanism, mm -hmm. all, all of which basically are control mechanism uh -huh. that, uh, that uh, maintain some quantity uh -huh. uh, more or less permanent. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in spite of deviations like temperatures, salinity in the blood, oxygen in the blood, things like that. Uh -huh. So that led them to the conclusion that there is a general theory of control mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, cybernetics come from the term, uh, the, the Greek kybernetis, the, the Latin derivation, uh, governor, uh, the st sturman, the, the man who stirs the boat uh -huh. and gets you to the target in uh -huh. spite of the change in currents and wind directions and so forth. So you correct for deviations all the time to uh -huh. get there. And that led uh, Winner to, to, uh, and his group to, to uh, claim that there is a general theory here that is true for all regulating mechanisms, whether in nature, in physiology, or man-made, like uh, all, the, all the regulating automatic processes in chemical industry or, or anything. Uh -huh. And this declared a new science, cybernetics, uh -huh. and uh, that's where it started. Right. Wow. And, and that is really the essence of systems theory, systems thinking, complexity, just, just the interaction of complex systems and how they, how they operate, what, what triggers them to, to go with into With a action. very specific uh, 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 focus on the mechanism, the underlying mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the great insights, the early insight, was that there is a direct correlation between the behavior, the output of systems, their behavior, and their internal structures, uh -huh. and that the behavior is always any behavior right. is always mediated by a particular structure. Yeah. Now this sounds now very simple, but think about how profound an idea it is, and think how. In most cases, when we try to change things, when we try to reform things, we focus on the behavior, not on the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so then, um, so, so, I, I want to ask you that that background of yours in architecture, systems thinking, and cybernetics, and how you went from those fields into the field of sustainability. But I'm I'm interested in 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 just taking it back one step first. After you got your doctorate in cybernetics, you began working in in um, met with management, managing consultant. So you were applying systems thinking and cybernetics to companies. Now, the the, the in England in those days, there was a group headed by uh, another phenomenal uh, gentleman, uh, Stafford Beer, mm -hmm. and Stafford Beer. Uh, was important in concept from cybernetics to management and organization, beginning to model organizations, companies, countries, societies, if you will, as a cybernetic system. 
And the insights from that are, are, are really tremendous. I, I think they're second to none in, in, in management literature, uh -huh. although they've not been uh, too popular uh, uh, yeah. uh, yet. So I gravitated to, to that group and their work largely because I saw all the issues that Fuller was raising as essentially management issues. How mm -hmm. do you manage world resources? Uh -huh. How do you manage nine billion people on a planet with diminishing resources? Uh, so I in a sense, th this is not a political question. This is not, it's a kind of design management mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt that if you want to contribute to that arena, you better understand those uh, new concepts that were emerging uh -huh. there. So uh, by the time I finished my uh, uh, PhD that uh, incidentally focused on applying Kotzen from cybernetics to a theory of evolution, uh, again, trying to understand how complex systems evolve. What, uh -huh. what, is the, what is the nature of the process there and what are the mechanisms that mediate it? Uh, and, and so having that, seeing the issues that Fuller is raising as management issues, I decided that what I need is a lot of experience with management processes. I didn't uh -huh. want to take a job with a company or something. So I was looking for, uh, and, and was very lucky actually, from the early days to get the sequence of uh, consulting assignments with organization of all type, not necessarily businesses, a lot in healthcare mm -hmm. industry, the financial industry and, and, and others that allowed me to experiment with those notions. How do you actually take an organization now and advise it about uh, strategic questions, about the organizational design as distinct mm -hmm. from organization uh, uh, behavior, how mm -hmm. components fit, uh -huh. and, and particularly about change processes. Uh -huh. uh, and, and so the, the, the sustainability issues <laughs> that we're involved with now, or the Fuller was raising, we're, we're not popular yet enough in those days, so there was no, there was no uh, employment there, so to speak. So I was, as I said, I was very uh, lucky to secure over the years a sequence of assignments of uh, increasing complexity that allowed mm -hmm. me basically the, the uh, luxury of playing with those ideas and experimenting with them and, and actually uh, confirming mm -hmm. how powerful and how potent they are. Uh, and, and then uh, probably by the late 80s, I suddenly found myself being called on project that more and more, I think the world were catching up, so to speak, mm -hmm. a project that more and more had to do with all those dimensions that Fuller was talking about. Oh, so you were already so, getting immersed in so it. So these were projects usually of la large uh, regional development projects and things like this that require uh, systemic integrations mm -hmm. of issues of uh, society and its economy and the environment and technology and all those things that are usually uh, not being put together in, in, a, in a synergetic way. Uh -huh. so, so just like you could have rested your laurels on being an architect, you could have rested your laurels in being a management consultant using your using your pioneering mind and, and, and mindset on systems thinking and cybernetics to continue working in it with management and companies and organizations. But then you segued into full scale sustainability, ultimately starting the sustainability lab. So I'm interested in knowing how that came about to uh, continue well, to go all the way. Uh, first, I never thought about laurels. I mean, you know, yeah. just no, no, yeah. one, one uh, yeah. uh, continuous. Uh, uh, it was basically like forming my, my own university, if you like, and, and keeping my education uh, in, in the way that I thought was uh, the mo mo most powerful. And it mm -hmm. always had to do the right balance between conceptual development and actually experimenting with concept in, in real projects. So by the, by the, as I mentioned, by the late 80s and, and subsequently I find myself more and more to deal with issues that uh, dealt, if not with sustainability directly, with all this uh, uh, kind of uh, elaborate set of issues that have to be uh, understood to deal with more complex thing than a company or, or an organization like this. And I think that by the end of the 80s, early 90s, I find myself at the heart of the multilateral development uh, world. This is the development organizations like the World Bank, other development banks, uh, some UN agencies, some of the global environmental convention, the global environment facility, all of these, where the concept of sustainable development that has been 
uh, uh, that emerged by then was being internalized mm -hmm. in the work of those organizations. Uh, and more and more I focused on that and to the exclusion of all the other issues that I dealt with before. Yeah, so, so you're, you talk about evolution, your mind fairly, you, you weren't uh, content to just settle for, for, I don't know, the status quo. You continually kept evolving yourself and then you said you went on, on a little bit of a hiatus as you tried to determine how you were going to best work in the sustainability field. Well, what was happening there was, you know, at once for the first few years, I was extremely happy because I thought that here I am at the heart of the, at the cutting edge of what was happening internationally with all these large, uh, venerable organizations uh, and, and being involved in some very interesting projects in different parts of the world. But uh, very soon I began to be increasingly concerned uh, about the huge gap between the rhetoric of sustainable development that I heard they were in, what was actually happening on the ground. And, and uh, I began to understand the limitation better, I understand better the limitations of those large organizations in pursuing their own goals even. Mm -hmm. uh, and the limitations uh, are interesting. Uh, I think in the, one is the, the complete fragmentation, internal fragmentation that, that, that is due to the professional specialization so you have departments that are like silos oh, for water, yeah. for energy, for this, for this, for that. And it's very difficult to integrate those on one issue. And development projects, if anything, they are comprehensive that require the integration of all those dimensions. Uh, so you have this issue, you have a lot of other issues that the multilaterals are extremely politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, and decisions have to be done by uh, consensus, which means always looking for the lowest common denominator. Oh. And once you get yeah. there, usually there's no relation anymore between the issue that you decide on and the actual problem. Uh, and, and the private sector organization have uh, different, uh, but also severe limitations, in the sense that the large companies uh, uh, no matter how adventurous they could, a CEO can be with respect to internalizing concept of sustainability in his company, uh, very soon he will hit the very low th threshold or the very low ceiling of the uh, current accounting system that requires him to show results every quarter and take mm -hmm. care of the, how do you call it, the, the, the shareholder value and, and so on. So there are huge limitations there as well which to me meant that neither could be uh, effective environments for experimentation. And experimentation is what we need. Why? Uh, because if you think about it, the kind of issues, change issues, that are required to secure a sustainable future for humanity and the planet are unprecedented. Right completely unprecedented. There's no cookbook we can go mm -hmm. to, there's no manual that can tell us what to do, and there's no expert who knows what to do. There's no president of a country or, 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 or a company or whatever who has the answer here. It's a completely new uh, equ equation. Nobody knows how to manage nine billion people on the planet in, 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 uh, in, in a harmonious kind of peaceful way. Uh, and when you look at that, uh, you, you know, a, a lot of the arguments of, or, or not arguments, but a lot of the scenarios that different demographers are talking about these days, whether it will be 9 billion or 10 billion or 11 billion, these are really arguments about the, 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 the so to speak, the angle of the tip of the mm -hmm. curve. The big difference is already occurred throughout 15, thousand years of history, there was not, never more than a billion people on the planet. So all the mechanisms that we have, or the governance, the structure of the economy, the way we make decisions, the way we interact with each other, the concepts of competition, every, all the fundamental mechanism that drives our civilization are irrelevant to the task that need to be performed now. Hence the idea of the lab. You mm -hmm. need to experiment. If you, if you are afraid to make mistakes, you're not going to experiment. And most of those organizations are referred to by nature. And it's not a criticism. They have to be that way. But they are risk averse. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a risk averse uh, uh, environment, you cannot bring about breakthroughs. 
Right. So the the concept of the uh, of the lab uh, stems out of that understanding of the nature of change that is required. It's not just tinkering at the margin. It's a fundamental change in everything that we know. We have to really examine uh, everything that we think we know. So it's a second order change. It's it's a second order change that requires change in the way we deal with things not only in how we, we, we deal it, changing the decision rules itself, uh, not just operating under a decision rule and changing. And so obviously that means uh, you need to experiment and hence the idea of the lab. And I think that if you look at it, some of the greatest labs that we have around now, are the big defense laboratories, they are incredible in the sense of the concentration of intellectual power mm -hmm. uh, the thousands of PhDs and so forth, but everybody is involved with uh, with uh, fantastic research about how to create better bombs, smarter things, and so mm -hmm. forth. And we apply the same talent to what Fuller used to call living re. Living re is against to uh, weaponry. Uh -huh. uh, you can start making sense. So the lab is, in, in a way, uh, a Don Quixote, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, uh, from the viewpoint of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, it's a serious uh, proposition and a serious declaration. Let's begin to organize world around talent the best that there is in trying to resolve many of those issues. Right. And those issues, again, and this is where Fuller had a fantastic insight and he was absolutely right. Those issues are not political issues. You cannot solve them by being a Democrat or a Republican or which group you're in. These are design problems. You have to understand the science. You have to understand the underlying way that systems work. And you have to apply it in a way that makes sense. Yeah. So, so. And then, in, so, so in 2008, you officially launched the Sustainability Lab. And, and as you bring up the Don Quixote, you went on a, you know, you had a vision and, and you wanted to put into action that it was time to act without interference or, or the bureaucracies or the consensus to the lowest common denominator. And, and so you went up against big odds in that Don Quixote quest, tilting at windmills and monsters, so to speak. <laughs> um, so, so what is what um, what is the mission of the Sustainability Lab? Well, the, the first thing was to think what would make it different than any other institute for sustainability or center for sustainability or, or something of sustainability that are now sprouting everywhere in big numbers. And I thought that there are two things that we're missing in that arena, and one was a more rigorous definition of what sustainability means in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, today, I mean, the word has been used so liberally and so all over the place that it's lost its meaning. It, it's uh, it's kind of diluted completely. In, in, in fact, if you look at it uh, and you, you make a, a survey of where the word sustainability is used, you'll see that it's used today as an adjective for almost everything. Yeah. Uh, the prevailing definition which came from the Brundtland Commission, a UN Commission on Environment and Development that talked about sustainable development, uh, I was never very satisfied with because it's a definition that, um, it's a typical UN thing that everybody can agree to or about. Uh, it's this cross-generational, the idea that sustainable development is development that takes care of current needs without jeopardizing future generations. So nobody will say I'm against future generations, or I'm for jeopardizing future generations, but it doesn't give you any operational uh, meaning and everybody can agree to it and then go back home and continue to do what they've done before. So I thought that we need a, a more rigorous definition and uh, so it took some time to develop that and then to derive from that definition a set of principles that you have to abide by with if you are serious about this business of transitioning to sustainability as a system-wide state, as a planetary system state. Uh, and that took probably about a year and a half or so, a year and a half or two to develop both the definition and, and the, those principles. And the idea was that that will become the intellectual, so to speak, uh, or, mm -hmm. or part of the intellectual uh, uh, basis of the lab and the project that we will do will be showcase model mm -hmm. project that will illustrate the uh -huh. applications of those principles in actual projects. Right. So, so again, going back to that metaphor of Don Quixote, you, you had the vision, you had the idea of how to define sustainability and put that as kind of the, um, 
the, the foundation on, on how to build what you're trying to do. And now, you know, two, number of years later, here we are in 2014, what you're doing is not just a conceptual, abstract or intellectual exercise. You have a lot to rest your hat on and, and continuing. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about you're, you're doing work right now presently both in um, the desert, the Negev desert in Israel with the Bedouin community and Israeli and Israeli too, government and, and university and in Costa Rica. So I'm wondering uh, first talk about what exactly is going on in uh, Israel. Uh, before that, I want to comment about this uh, th this bridge between the conceptual, the intellectual, uh -huh. and, and the real. Uh, this was extremely important, and it's at the heart of the philosophy of the lab is to is to actually combine research and development, right. demonstration, thinking and demonstration. Uh, it was ex ex extremely important in the beginning because the the way the principles were. Uh, were expressed was in a very high level kind of abstract language uh, and that was the power because it meant that you could take those principles then and interpret them almost with any kind of situation uh, that was the intention uh, but uh, most people that I was talking to were insisting on understanding what it would mean what mm -hmm. will you actually do uh, and I was trying at the time to uh, uh, to kind of get away from the way that sustainability projects have been defined, uh, project in sustainable development were defined at the time, uh, which is related to problem area like uh, biodiversity or climate change or deserts or water. Uh, do you see that? This is again that uh, 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 professional, the, the world doesn't work like this. Mm -hmm. This is how the professions work. Uh, so I didn't want to say, okay, we, we will do climate change. Uh, we will work on water. I wanted to say what we will do is apply those conceptual framework that uh, involves a number of uh, components, a, a system view of the world first, uh, an understanding of mechanisms <laughs> and change mm -hmm. and the sustainability pr principles and saying that any issue that you will take, regardless of whether it's urban, uh, high industrial or, or marginal community in the desert, some, any issue that you will take, the difference will be looking at it through that particular prisms. Mm -hmm. In particular, the, again, there's, it's taking the system view and the sustainability principle that in themselves reflect the system view of the world. And they say that you need to integrate a number of dimensions. The, the principle are expressed in relation to five dimensions. The physical dimension, which is where energy and and, and kind of meta processes are involved. This is the, the fundamental basis of, uh, of existence, if you will. There's the question of the, the, the economic dimensions. What is it that you count? What do you consider as wealth? What do you consider as your prime? The, the issue, the, the, the uh, social dimension, which is how, mm -hmm. how uh, societies organize, how we interact with each other. The life dimensions, we are only one species in a complex planet. How do, and we are not very good neighbors, right? How we interact in the biosphere with other species. And the, what I came to understand is at the heart of all the spiritual dimension, the value dimension, what are we about? All the rest is only techniques, is how you do mm -hmm. things and why. Uh, yeah. Now the, the, the purpose and, and the, 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 uh, the, 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 the orientation is in that physical dimension and in the spiritual dimension that we tend to disregard. We think it's some, something there, it's a religious issue, or it's something for saints, it's not for everybody or something, but this is at the heart. This is really the, the, uh, the, the center of gravity that holds all the mm -hmm. other together. Now, there are, there are very many excellent projects around the world today that deal with aspects of, of what I would call sustainability. There are projects about water, or projects about energy, or projects about children, or projects about women, or this or that. They rarely integrate all those dimensions in one place. So I was looking for an opportunity to actually take an issue, a real development issue, and demonstrate the application of that totality, that system view, in a, a, real, uh, a, a, a real case on the ground, with real people, with real problems, with real mm -hmm. uh, whatever. And the opportunity to do this project with the Bedouin community in the Negev uh, came about. And what this project uh, amounts to is basically developing with that community a model for uh, agriculture in in an arid zone, uh, a model that is based on the Bedouin knowledge, experience, and 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 uh, 
uh, tradition with the desert. Nobody knows deserts better than this community, but really leverage with the very advanced uh, green technologies of very kind and approaches to agriculture and so on. And as I said, the opportunity, again, a, a piece of luck mm -hmm. uh, and some good support with some friends and, and uh, colleagues. And, uh, and basically, again, like, like we talked before about those serendipitous things, uh, having met the right person in the Bedouin community. Uh, obviously, you needed somebody who wants to work mm -hmm. with you. And uh, I was very uh, fortunate to meet a young Bedouin leader who is a mayor of one of the small villages in the desert. Uh, he's a very exceptional young man. He, he uh, exceptional in a number of ways, not only with his uh, personal integrity and capacity. He has a PhD in chemistry, which you would right. understand is very rare in that community. Mm -hmm. But uh, we hit it off uh, when we met the first time when I was exploring within the Bedouin uh, community possibilities for developing this initiative. And we hit it off uh, again right away, and we decided to go for it together, and that was how the thing began. Yeah, so so I, I want to go delve into it more, but you but you brought up a very um, excellent point, and and it's and and I've noticed that it's part of also part of what fuels you and the mission statement of Sustainability Lab, and I would say probably a mission statement of your own life, in in that you know reminded me of uh, uh, what I'm getting at is that. You, as you were saying, you feel it's important, not just the physical manifestation of your work, but to change people's, the way they think, that that's part of what's created the crises. Now, I, mean, I mean, we know what a lot of things that are behind climate change and unsustainable lifestyles and everything, but it's really comes down to mental models. And, and you say that in order for a new paradigm to come in, it has to become ingrained in someone's consciousness. So that seems to me when you talk about like building that intellectual foundation, that, that seemed to be something that was really at the heart of what yeah, you were doing. But on the other hand, I, I must say that I was never about changing anybody. <laughs> right, right. I, I wanted to start by understanding for myself what yeah. the issues mean. But no, th this is an important point because uh, uh, you, you can go and advocate. And so here's the change. And, and a lot mm -hmm. of change makers, I think, focus on advocacy. And again, this is focusing on the behavior rather than the... What I tried to do is to, with, with this particular project and with the lab, is to create a space where the conditions will be such that they will foster the right change. Right. Yeah. Some people say it's it's to really create that change in behaviors, you have to change the people's stories. So by creating, as you say, creating the space for people that that foster things. So, for instance, just working in the desert, you have the Bedouins, the Israelis working hand in hand, side by side, and as you say, communities that have fought, have, have had a lot of strife and friction between them are, are together, right, harmoniously. Well, first, the Bedouins are Israelis. They are full citizens uh -huh. of the right. state of Israel and so on. I, I think that the, the, uh, the uniqueness, one of the unique aspects of this project is, I, I think because of its comprehensive, uh, because of its compre their, uh, comprehensive approach, because of its design, because of the fact that there's almost every, uh, almost any aspect that you can think of, of the human experience has a component in this project. Mm -hmm. it, it's really fascinating that way. It's yeah. the, the mosaic that incredible. It attracted a lot of unlikely interested parties from a group of uh, donors from abroad and from Israel to uh, a few local kibbutzim, to the academic uh, uh, world, some researchers from mm -hmm. the university, to large organizations like the Jewish National Fund, to the government itself, yeah. and so on. Suddenly, they're all finding themselves collaborating mm -hmm. on this project, Wadi uh, And I think this is one of the uh, incredible parts of it, but it was not intentional in the sense of uh, going and pushing people, now you have to collaborate, uh, mm -hmm. or you have to coexist, or you have to do this, you have to do that. It's creating almost like a, it's creating almost like a greenhouse for a group of people, giving an opportunity and protecting it, mm -hmm. and then see what happened. And what happens is miracles, because you can see people transforming. Suddenly people who were, uh, uh, had no opportunity to 
to express their creativity, suddenly, mm -hmm. boom, they can do miracles, and that's mm -hmm. what's happening here. Yeah. So, so it was not by taking a person and saying, you got to change, you got to right, do this, you right. got to do this. He's saying, here's an opportunity, do you want to participate? Right. So it, one person say, yeah, I'd like to participate, and another say, no, I'm not, I don't have the time. And, but something is created there as a kernel, as a seed, and then it begins to grow. Uh -huh. And if you tend it correctly, you, you find, like the picture they show you with all the trees and all the birds mm -hmm. and all that. Right. So, so in a way, as I said, it really changed the story, changed the mental models of people just by the, the act of doing. And so um, I want to talk about li like this, I don't want to use the word magic, but what you've done in the desert is, is truly phenomenal. You've taken, and, and you just started a year, a little over a year ago, from, from the conceptual stage to, to actually, um, the, and the planning to, to the development and doing the land. So you've taken a desert, about 100 acres of desert land and, and created this really biodiverse, um, um, now what it, what it is, the land that it is. You, know, you want to, Would you like to say more about it? Yeah, well, first, it's not me. I mean, well, I... Well, right, you, you <laughs> but, helped uh, spearhead, but yeah, it's, but, uh, it takes a team. We have, as I told you, the, 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 the project is about the model of agriculture in an arid zone, so obviously it has to do with plants and life and so forth. Uh, the, the site that we obtained, that we were given by the government, is a wonderful site, it's about 100 acres, it's sizable, but it's really barren, there's nothing there, completely nothing. And the soil in that part of the world is such that when it rains, the top hardens right away uh, like uh, concrete. So water doesn't absorb into the ground, but create these erosion patterns of rivulets that, that flow into larger ravines, into larger ravines. And you have this phenomena in the Negev where you get rain in one place when it rains, and then floods like 20 kilometers away. So yeah. water does stay in the place. So we have a wonderful uh, researcher from the Ben-Gurion University, uh, Stefan Liu, who is responsible for the soil enhancement and water retention program that we developed. Some very interesting ideas, uh, very much against the grain of, uh, of conventional wisdom uh, that really transformed the site. And from the beginning, the intention was, you see, the, 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 this area has been mismanaged for hundreds of years in terms of uh, soil management. That's mm -hmm. why it's a desert now, the northern part of, of uh, the Negev. Mm -hmm. uh, bed management practices and agriculture and grazing and so forth have really destroyed it. So what one aspect of Project Wadiatir is this uh, ecosystem restoration, if you will. Uh, so we said this place is, is really, uh, the, the, the soil is very, uh, impoverished in, in organic matter. We need to bring back organic matter to it. We have to uh, create a whole ecosystem there that will be uh, full of life. And for that, we have to be able to retain the water on the site and so forth. And Stefan designed a, a, a very nice uh, system that is apparently working very well. Uh, we're very happy with the results. And the results are quite amazing. One of the, uh, the, 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 the focus of our program in, on, on this particular aspect of the project has been, as I said, in soil enhancement and water retention. But we always had the idea that we'd like to create ways to enrich the biodiversity of the site. This is a site that probably saw a couple of scorpions and maybe a raven if there was a dead uh, animal there. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's transforming completely. And what, what took me entirely by surprise was the speed in which that happens because you create an ecosystem, and in that ecosystem, all the key elements uh, self-reinforce, and the amplification factor is huge. So only, I would say, within a few months, four to six months of planting the first trees, mm -hmm. everything transformed, the whole yeah. flora of the site. Uh -huh. uh, and then with flowers and change of flora, all the cross-pollinating uh, insects uh, uh -huh. arrive, and with the insects, all kind of birds arrive, and right. with the birds, uh, all, all kinds of uh, predators arrive. Mm -hmm. So today, when you look at the site, it's, uh, it's no longer this barren, uh, yellow, brownish, hard, whatever. It's full of trees, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of fruit trees, a lot of birds, a lot of butterflies, a lot of insects. Uh, we have a family of rabbits at the side uh -huh. there. And, and, and you're growing food and herbs and... and yeah, we're growing, uh, we, we have a very interesting uh, project with uh, authentic desert um, uh, uh, vegetables that are going out mm -hmm. of style, very important to bring them back. 
right. uh, to preserve this genetic uh -huh. material and so forth. This is a women-led pr program right. uh, that where we'll try to collect seeds that are not used anymore. Of uh, these are simple things like. Uh, like tomatoes or cucumbers and, mm -hmm. and so on, but nobody uses them anymore. Some of the Bedouin families still keep those seeds, but everybody runs to the supermarket to buy fluffy tomatoes that have no... Mm -hmm. And now these are things that are desert hardy, they can do well without a lot of water, they, they can do well with high salinity, and they're extremely potent, they're really nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the nutrition value is very high. And nutrition is one of the problems in this community, like many other com uh, Aboriginal communities, that in, with the transition to from the origin from their own to the Western type diets, uh, you have an epidemic of all the modern diseases: uh, obesity, diabetes, high uh -huh. blood pressure, all uh -huh. the, all, the various kinds of cancers, and so on. So, nutrition is an important thing. Anyway, I'm running into the nutrition instead of going. So. Um, uh, those vegetables, we have a whole program with medicinal plants, uh, using the Bedouin knowledge of medicinal plants in order to domesticate some of this plant and create, mm -hmm. a, a, create basically a, 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 a product line of, uh, of cosmetic health-related products that rely on that uh -huh. knowledge. Right. And, and then you're also doing uh, solar and wind projects there too. Yeah, the, the, the site itself, which is basically an agricultural operation again, uh, coupled with a very interesting, uh, which is becoming now a regional education center, which will provide uh, uh, technical support to all the outlying villages, as well as a, a, a place for all the high school kids from the Negev, not just Bedouins, everybody, come mm -hmm. there to do uh, their environmental and ecological studies. Uh, this whole site is supported by a very interesting design for an integrated uh, system of green technologies mm -hmm. that basically connect all the different functions, such as we minimize waste in a sense that the output of every one system becomes the input to another. And that system combines uh, a generation of, uh, of uh, biogas, uh, production of compost, the recycling of uh, wastewater and cleaning of wastewater, as well as at the heart of it is the energy uh, production system that is a very interesting combination of uh, wind and solar. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's, it's just uh, incredible. And, and, and right, you corrected me when I said that you created this because it's the sustainability lab. It's been the work of the collaboration of many people and you helped with your vision start it. But it's just phenomenal what's been created from barren desert um, and then you, you decide to extrapolate, but in a different geography, in a different zone totally, as opposed to going to another desert, you went to a tropical area in Costa Rica. Um, so what made you decide to shift gears and do that? It, it's not shifting gears. It's one of the concepts for the lab uh, it's, it has been to try and identify uh, kind of advanced research centers that map onto particular ecozones, mm -hmm. because I think the the distinction of ecozones uh, is a better distinction for issues of development than than uh, land use management, so to speak, is better distinction than any other one that is used conventionally today, like south and north, or poor and rich, or developed yeah, or underdeveloped. Right. Uh, an ecozone presents humanity with the same problem, regardless whether it's in Arizona, or in Israel, or in China the same issues of water, the same issues of soil, the same issues of energy, and so forth. Uh, so the idea for the lab was to identify such research centers around the world that map onto ecozones and, and create a network that will actually be the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Israel, we formed one with the Blauson Institute of uh, Desert Research. To, so any problem that relates to desertification that we'll do in the future at the moment Researchers from that university support Project Wadiatir. In the future, any project that we'll do that relates to issues of sustainability in desert and arid environment will be done through that entity there. In Costa Rica, we formed a similar thing with Earth University to deal with issues of the humid and dry tropics. Mm -hmm. And we have another kind of pro program there that is more pedagogical in nature. We have a prize program where uh, graduate uh, students from the Earth from University. Earth University. Graduate this is the fourth year students who take an entrepreneurial track. They have to develop a project 
uh, and this project has to be enacted in, in many cases. Uh, and though that the, the, the project that best exemplifies or demonstrates the, the integration of the sustainability principles win the prize. And it's a substantial prize mm -hmm. for a kid in, in Central America and so on. And that, that program was going on now for five years. We've just uh, been given the resources to continue for another five. So it's very exciting. But with Earth University, we have created that center that will go beyond the education to actually enact some project there, I hope. Yeah. And I hope that over the year, maybe in five years when we talk again, I could tell you that we've covered all the type of ecosystems on the planet. We have in, 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 in uh, we're thinking about um, an alpine zone, perhaps uh, in collaboration with Bhutan. Uh, 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 we're thinking about uh, uh, islands ecology, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps with the Galapagos. I'd like to see an urban ecology centers, maybe mm -hmm. based in New York, but yeah. uh, and 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 so on. Yeah. So so you've already um, like like these other regions now, the mountainous, the high mountain zone, and island and uh, what Galapagos and urban. You've already started to uh, spin your web or, or or put out your feelers to to do these. Yes. Yeah. We'll see how it goes now. Well, know. I would say that people have to take you seriously now. I mean, perhaps. Back in 2008, and, and those early days of, of designing, starting the sustainability lab, and you saying what you wanted to do, oh, I'm going to start a sustainability project in the desert in Israel with the Bedouins. Um, people probably looked at you and said, "Michael, you're that's great." <laughs> but there, let's let's. Uh, what let's kind of Kool Aid, let's what kind of Kool -Aid yeah. have you been drinking? <laughs> but now people have to. When you talk about Bhutan or Galapagos, anywhere. They have to uh, say, oh. I should hope so. I, I, I think that the, 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 the major investment of the last six or seven years, which was substantial uh, in time and treasure and so forth, was really to demonstrate a concept. And so uh, the way that I look at it, if you like, is the lab has, has kind of just graduated from a proof of concept. Right. Uh, the, 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 we've done a lot of very interesting things. Uh, there's a lot of uh, great people who are involved with the work uh -huh. of the lab now. Uh, I think our new website uh, is quite exciting. So there's something real there. And I think that what we have to gear up now is to really take it to the, uh, talking about evolution, <laughs> mm -hmm. to the next step of its evolution, which requires a completely different uh, scale of integration. Uh, we need to get uh, more people involved. We need to get more resources involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the next challenge. Yeah. So what would you say is the 10-year vision, if, if you've thought that far ahead, 10-year vision of the lab? Well, I think 10 years perhaps is, a, is a, in, in 10 years, you, you should think about the sustainability laboratory as the MIT, of, <laughs> the global MIT of sustainability. Uh, but I, I'm thinking more in terms of three and five years. Uh, and I think in five years, you'd, you'd have, you know, we launched a very interesting program that we call the Global Sustainability Fellows which is to really provide uh, better exposure, learning experience on a graduate level to students from different disciplines, from different universities. Uh, this project, we, we just had the, the first pilot session uh, this summer. Actually, it was at Earth University in Costa Rica. We need to take that program and make it into a yearly program and increase the number of uh, graduates uh, who uh, will form uh, basically an alumni network, a global alumni network. In, in this first step that we took, which was uh, uh, quite modest, we had 20 students from 15 countries. We had 49 applications from 21 countries. So there's always uh, people want it. Yeah. Uh, and we, so we'll have to learn from what we've done in that pilot mm -hmm. to, this is a whole program that needs to be instituted. So five years from now, this should be a, a th well thought after and well thought of uh, uh, a program with many graduates who are now forming this network of alumni yeah. and uh, work with the lab or work among themselves uh -huh. or I influence their, the whole idea for that incidentally is that the, the students come from all disciplines. So architects and engineers and uh, lawyers and uh, health care people and mm. philosophers, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, multidisciplinary in nature. So this is one I think in five years you'll want to see I don't know, at least five or six centers, mm -hmm. uh, like those ecozone centers, each with a large, uh, uh, high, uh, kind of a, a big scale project. A project by the Atir, incidentally, by the time it's all said and done, is about a $10 million project. So mm -hmm. in five years, if there are five centers, you'd want to see 
uh, at least five, if not more, s uh, projects of that night. All demonstration, all model project, demonstration right. project. Yeah. Uh, I think the lab will be um, more known by then. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it will perhaps be well on the way to support, uh, to, to solve an issue of long-term uh, viability, economic viability, uh -huh. that, 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 it, it, that kind of maps onto the issues of the planetary issues. Right. So, so the right, the scale has to be right. You cannot do it with a million dollars a year that you have to run after, like many NGOs uh, have to do. So we'll see. We have to uh, assemble uh, a, a, a powerful international leadership in terms of the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, five rims so now, uh, probably somebody will have to come and replace me and, and yeah. so on, yeah. Yeah, well, I think one of the, one of the brilliant um, ideas or seeds among many that, that in starting for you and starting the sustainability lab is that you have the educational component, like the fellows program, that it's not just an organization that your vision, but you're bringing this understanding and teaching along with the specific, pro the concrete projects to other people to create young minds, other minds who are cross disciplinary way, I'd say lawyers and doctors or whoever, and they're also going to take these ideas and take this knowledge and bring it to wherever they do. So it's really like the um, the Asian saying, one grain, 10,000 grains, yeah. started with your seed and it's becoming 10,000 seeds. So and I really think that the, the, the potency of the seeds uh, in relation to the lab has to do with that integration of those three elements and that is research, new knowledge, mm -hmm. development, experimenting with that knowledge and demonstrating on the ground and education and creating uh, a, an increasingly a group of people but basically creating the, the future generation of leaders right. who understand uh, sustainability in a deep way not in the superficial way that everybody yeah. is now talking about. Anymore. Yeah, so talking about the future generation of leaders or leaders in general and you've worked with organizations, multinational organizations, the World Bank in terms of transformation, and you truly are a pioneer in, in the world in terms of transformation, Michael. But do you think we can expect things from our political leaders for transformation, or is it more we have to, we have to do it from the ground up? It's not from the ground up. No. I, I, I don't think you can expect much from our political leaders, not because there's something wrong with them, they're bad people or something, but the structure that they operate within mm -hmm. doesn't allow uh, it to, 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 to be elected president of the United States and say, I'm going to go to Washington and change. I mean, either you don't understand about change or you're just fooling everybody. Mm -hmm. You go there, you are shackled by a whole machinery with incredible self-reinforcing mechanism that uh, will keep you away from any major change. So. But change is required. So th this is where I go back to what I said earlier, that we really have to rethink everything. Uh, the, the political process on a national level as well, certainly on the international level, is not working. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the dinosaur. It has to be thrown out. I don't know how you throw it out. I don't know how. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, you re it, it's a, a real revolution uh, there, but not a revolution uh, in a sense of blood, of going, cutting some heads right, and replacing right. it. We really have to collaboratively think what is the governance mechanism that will work, that will work in a sense of uh, ensuring peace and tranquility and welfare of everyone mm -hmm. without any distinction of this or that or that or the other. And the political uh, uh, machinery today is not organized for that purpose. Simply, so it will not right. deliver on that. Right, and so, so it truly is a, it's a revolution in thinking, doing it, and the way we break down barriers for, for allowing people to interact and get away from polemics, and that's what you've truly done. Uh, beyond, again, beyond me there, I think what is very interesting is to see that the technology <laughs> for mm -hmm. connecting people is, is uh, actually emerging with right. the nature of the problem that we need to connect people. Right. Uh, and I hope that the, the technology that is so incredible there will be used for the right purpose. I mean, yeah. we know that most of the internet is, uh, uh, is used for, for uh, a really secondary kind of uh, things. Mm -hmm. uh, but if people start to interact, as they do, start to interact about solving problems together, uh, making commitments together, interacting together, and following through on ambitious projects, that's how the change will occur. It will not come from, 
from uh, the president of, uh, of uh, right. Exxon or the president of the United States yeah. for that matter. And, and as you said, you saw it firsthand working within, with companies, within companies, within the World Bank and even organizations interested in sustainability in that they were shackled by, by what they could do. Yeah, the inertia so, is enormous there. Right, and so you took it upon yourself to that pioneering spirit to go out in the world tilt against the windmills and monsters and achieve, not to use cliches, the impossible dream, which nothing is impossible, again, not to use a cliche, but you did. More than achieving, it's about making a statement, I think. Right. Uh, it, making a statement that at the end, individuals have to not accept the current conditions. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we are really serious about change, each person will have to figure out what's his contribution to it and go out of the prevailing conditioning that we are all exposed to from day one. The minute you are born, everybody tells you what to do and what's right and what's not right, and it, it's uh, impossible. So by the time you start performing in the world, you are basically acting everybody else's views of what should be done. That's not the way to, uh, right. to really think about what you should do yeah. yourself, what the contribution that you, me, as a person can make, what is the unique uh, what is the unique function? Why are we here? What can I do that nobody else can do? Not because I want to be better or, or higher or earn more or something, but what is the unique thing that if I express as part of this whole ecosystem, this symphony of human evolution, will make a contribution, a positive contribution in the, in the right direction. Yeah, that's well said. So I want to thank you, Michael. I know we could, we could go on to keep talking for a while, but, but I think what you're doing is brilliant. If people want to know more about the Sustainability Lab, how would they go about doing so? Well, the easiest is to go to our new website. It's uh, www.sustainabilitylabs.org. Uh -huh. And there'll be ways to contact and so forth. Yeah. And we'd like to and hear to from anybody or about something. Project Wada Hatir and, and, and learn about and all everything. the projects yeah. that you can Yeah. But thank you very much. It was well, a pleasure. Well, really thank you, great. Michael. Great. It's been great. Thank you very much. <laughs>